welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Snyder, a physician and child and adult holistic psychiatrist. Today is part two of a four-part series on our forgotten foundation, our first three years of life and early attachment experiences and how these shape us. In the last episode, I talked about what is happening during this early time and how this impacts future relationships and how we view ourselves and our lives. In today's podcast, I'll be discussing the many factors that can impact this formative time in our and our children's lives. I'll discuss the potential role of attachment in genetic expression and how attachment appears to impact the differentiation of the right and left hemispheres. And again, I'll be partly reading and paraphrasing from a book that I've been writing. First, to create some space for empathy for our own parents and for ourselves, if we are parents, know that as parents, we can have our own trauma, addictions, illness, which could be mental or physical illness. As parents, we can have preoccupation, for example, with another child who may be sick We could be struggling financially and just be glad to be able to feed our children. A natural disaster could be impacting our world. We may ourselves have been abused, neglected, or experienced threats of abandonment as children. And all of these could impact how we parent our children. And for anyone who thinks I would never, for example, abandon or harm a child, Be grateful because it's unlikely that you had experienced such things as an infant or a toddler. The cycle of abuse can occur if children are victims of abuse and or neglect, but also if they witness violence between their parents or caregivers. There doesn't have to be overt abuse or severe neglect. As parents, we can project our own unresolved conflicts onto our children For example, we could idealize one child and then have dislike or disdain for another. We can even be jealous of our infants and toddlers. We may be preoccupied with our careers or be pursuing our own self-worth. Maybe information about the importance of the first three years of life never crossed our paths or seemed particularly important if it had. Maybe we had a family system that was upside down where the children's emotional needs were secondary to the parents, or where the children were in the service of keeping the parents happy. We may have thought all that was normal and that other families were that way as well. In this particular family system, which is referred to as the narcissistic family, there is an obvious abuse or addiction. Everything can look just right, maybe too right, leaving the child feeling that what is wrong is them. As teens and then as adults, their struggles mirror those of adult children of alcoholics. However, in this case, those adults have a difficult time putting their finger on the problem. And because they idealize their parents, many will never move forward. Many will find themselves compulsively caregiving in their work and relationships If you think this may be you, you might find the books The Drama of the Gifted Child and or The Narcissistic Family, Diagnosis and Treatment. Either of those books might be helpful. Family stress can be an even less obvious impact on early childhood development. There could be significant family stress due to poverty, divorce, or multiple moves. The child's emotional needs may be set as a priority, However, the stress around the child is so high, inevitably the child's brain development is impacted. Research shows that parents' or caregivers' stress affects the child's developing brain structure and chemistry in ways that make them more susceptible to stress-related disorders later in life. And this makes sense. As infants and toddlers, our survival is dependent on our attention to our parents' stress response. We are taking in the stress response of those around us through their facial expressions and the tone of their voice, which impacts our autonomic nervous system and thus is impacting us without conscious thought. 
poor quality daycare can be another impact. There have been a number of studies that have looked at stress hormone levels in children in daycare settings compared to home care. Research finds that children who spend significant amounts of time in poor quality daycare, meaning high ratios of children to adults, less supportive relationships, and harsh adult-child interactions, these children had higher elevations of the stress hormone cortisol. Those with more sensitive temperaments were even more vulnerable. So high cortisol levels on a developing brain will prime the brain to be wired for danger. So the timing of factors that disrupt our early life or disrupt attachment matters. The earlier the attachment is disrupted, the more challenges we can face. For example, having a healthy attachment relationship during our first three years and then being placed in an institution, such as an international orphanage, would be expected to have fewer long-lasting negative impacts than if we went into an international orphanage, for example, at the time of our birth. So what about trauma? Because disrupted attachment leaves its impression on the autonomic nervous system, the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that senses threat, and stress hormone pathways, it is considered trauma. For this type of trauma, however, there are no words. There are literally no words. For later traumatic events in our lives, we have a way of verbalizing the experience. That doesn't mean that we can't also be changed by severely traumatic events later in life, but it means that we have the tools that we can use to essentially gain a sense of control, feel less vulnerable, we're more able to make sense of the traumatic event And we can even make meaning of it if we choose. So there are a lot of people who, by way of their early experience in those first three years, could be experiencing trauma and the impacts of trauma on their physiology unknowingly. So what about the argument of nature versus nurture? Research shows that having a sensitive and responsive caregiver can prevent elevations in cortisol levels among toddlers who have a fearful or anxious temperament. Research also suggests, as I mentioned, that shy children are especially vulnerable to high cortisol levels in poor quality daycare settings. This is important to consider, especially in our culture that promotes a one-size-fits-all approach to both early child care and education. Some of us will have a greater physiologic stress response to the same early life experience. An exaggerated stress response can have many downstream effects, including many of the topics that I've talked about, such as mast cell activation, elevated pyroles, dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, and even autoimmunity. The more stress we experience in our early life, the more likely these conditions are to be expressed. For example, some of us may have a significant genetic loading for pyrrole disorder. A secure attachment may have lowered the likelihood of us ever having this expressed. Or we may have had very little genetic loading, but because of attachment disruption, we go on to have symptoms of pyrrole disorder. So this interplay between genetic expression and attachment and early life experience is quite interesting. Researchers are looking into specifically how responsive caregiving impacts our genetic expression. Remember, we have a pair of genes, one from each parent. Some of these genes will have mutations. Methyl molecules called markers turn on and off genes causing them to be expressed or not expressed. A gene being expressed means that it makes a protein, and proteins being made or not made makes all the difference in our health. Our environment, for example, in the form of trauma or toxicity, can cause an epigenetic change. The original research into attachment and epigenetics was a study in which they looked at mother rats and they separated them into two groups— 
One group had mother rats who licked and groomed their pups quite a bit. The other group had mother rats who did not. Because the pups were expected to share the mother's genetic temperament and attachment style, they took some of the pups from each group and put them with the mothers of the opposite group. They found that the pups born of the licking and grooming rats, but reared by those that didn't lick and groom, went on to resemble the pups that were born and reared by the low licking and grooming mothers. And essentially they went on to become anxious adults. So which genes might this licking and grooming be impacted? The researchers identified one, which turns out to be very important in stress response. The glucocorticoid receptor is involved in the HPA, or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This particular receptor was altered through DNA methylation. So the licking and grooming altered the gene in such a way that the pups were less stressed as adults and went on to lick and groom their own pups. Later studies in humans post-mortem that were associated with child abuse have supported this finding that there is an epigenetic modification of this glucocorticoid receptor. Aside from genetic modification, there is a gene that has been identified that can decrease our vulnerability to negative environmental experiences. One of my child psychiatry mentors, who was Dr. Peter Tangay, he was actually the consulting psychiatrist for the movie Rain Man when he was at UCLA, and I knew him when he was at the University of Louisville. Anyway, he would comment about children who he would describe as the invulnerables. He was talking about those children who despite significant early life adversity seem to be fine. Since then, since the time of our conversation, research has shown that children who are homozygous, meaning they receive a particular gene from both parents, will show secure attachment regardless of their care. Not surprising, this gene relates to the transport of serotonin, the key neurotransmitter associated with feelings of well-being and happiness. So could attachment impact brain structure? To me, this research that I'm going to talk about is fascinating, but to start, imagine cradling a newborn infant in your arms. Likely, if you're a woman, you're You're positioning the baby's head in the left and thus carrying their weight in your left arm. Studies show this to be the case in 60 to 90% of women, independent of whether they have their own children. This female gender-specific motor behavior has been observed across cultures and other times in history as seen in photographs, in children holding their dolls, and even different animal species. This bias does lessen after the infant is three months old. Until then, however, the research suggests the left cradle bias indicates a higher quality of attachment and attunement. There is debate about how being left-handed, which is 10% of people, could impact this preference. One study found that mothers who were separated from their children for 24 hours did not show a significant cradle-side preference. So they would sometimes carry on the left and sometimes carry on the right. Other studies observed a right cradling preference in mothers who were separated from their children from the first to the seventh day. Right cradling parents were found to have had mental health conditions prior to their child being conceived and were more likely to have been worried about childbirth. Other research has shown that depressed mothers and those reporting domestic violence had reduced left cradle bias. Collectively, the research suggests that the right cradle bias may be reflective of less of an ability to become emotionally involved with the infant. So what is happening in that left cradle position? It seems without thinking we put infants in our left visual field and our left auditory field. 
And keep in mind that sensory information that's coming in from the left is transmitted to the right hemisphere of our brain. It's the right side of the brain that's associated with empathy. Also, mostly residing in the right hemisphere is our ability to recognize emotional facial expressions such as crying, which is important if we need to monitor the well-being of our child. As infants, this position would allow us to be able to see more of our mother's face. It also turns out that the left side of the face is more emotionally expressive, again, because the facial muscles on the left are connected to the right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere is good for detecting and reacting to threatening stimuli, which helps us in that sort of fight-or-flight response. And thus, it's important for our survival. But also, it's important for detecting and reacting to smiles. Just as it's good for us to be able to read the infant, it's good for the infant to be able to read us as caregivers. If we are a mother who is anxious, depressed, traumatized, or sick after birth, we may not have the capacity to take in any more emotions from our infant. We could even experience our infant as another threat and instinctively cradle them on the right. The right cradle bias could be a red flag that a mother and her infant are in need. This need could potentially be identified even when that mother was a child herself. There is research showing children who cradle dolls on the left show higher social cognitive abilities than those who don't. These girls likely have greater right hemispheric capacities from their own attachment experience and genetics, and their doll carrying would be predictive of how they would carry their own infant someday. I would also add to that notion of if a mother is highly anxious, depressed, traumatized, or sick, that we could include toxicity in that, as someone experienced high levels of toxicity would impact their ability to emotionally engage and be available to their infant. So I'd like to end with a lovely blessing for a child entering the world by John O'Donohue. And this is speaking in first person of the child. As I enter my new family, may they be delighted at how their kindness comes into blossom. Unknown to me and them, may I be exactly the one to restore in their forlorn places new vitality and promise. May the hearts of others hear the music in the lost echoes of their neglected wonder. If my destiny is sheltered, may the grace of this privilege reach and bless the other infants who are destined for torn places. If my destiny is bleak, may I find in myself a secret stillness and tranquility beneath the turmoil. May my eyes never lose sight of why I came here, that I never be claimed by the falsity of fear or eat the bread of bitterness." In everything I do, think, feel, and say, may I allow the light of the world I am leaving to shine through and carry me home. So in the next episode, I'll be going into more depth, but know that we all fall on the attachment spectrum based on these early life experiences. The spectrum on one end is avoidance and dismissiveness. In the middle is a secure attachment. And on the far right is anxious and preoccupied. So in the middle of that attachment spectrum lies our greatest ability to connect with others while still having autonomy and the ability to recognize and express our feelings and not be overwhelmed by them. Again, I'll be going into more depth about how attachment is measured in both toddlers and adults and how we can even recognize where we may fall on that spectrum. If you'd like to read more about this topic, please visit my website at CourtneySnyderMD.com and please share this information if you know someone who you think it may be helpful for. And I will look forward to connecting with you in the next podcast.
And until then, take care. Bye-bye.